Right, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> this is uh, Guru Tom Pena. Uh, we uh, for FMA discussion episode two, three, four, and tonight we have uh, Guru Dragan of uh, Lameko Astig, uh, Serbia, with us. Good evening, bro. How are you doing? Yeah, good evening. It was a uh, sort of a you know close call. I barely made home fifteen minutes before. <laughs> you oh, know, wow. before uh Tight schedule, right? because I, I got stuck in the traffic commuting from work you know but uh oh, in the end you know it it worked out now oh, that's good that's good that's good i know it's kind of it's going to be like tense just during that time that you're um trying to get back home <coughs> <coughs> yeah i mean a couple of days ago you know we, we talked about uh heavy snowfall we still you know have it uh, lying around so uh, the traffic oh. is a little dense all right okay that's okay. So, um, is your snowman still up? <laughs> no, I will <coughs> fine. <laughs> so again, sorry if I'm coughing. It's not nothing to do with COVID. It's just my asthma. You know, I am... So far, it's still not uh, you know transferable online. So I think you know we're okay <laughs> with it. Yeah, we're we're good. We're still good. Okay, so. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. If you are watching this uh, live interview now, um, please say hi. Uh, smash the heart button or the like button, and also please tell us where you're watching from. Okay. Um, so, shall we just jump into it now, bro? Absolutely. See, see I have the, the support from uh, Naruto and Kakashi up there, so you know. I'm, <laughs> my, my, my uh, I love it. No, no, no trouble there. <laughs> I love Naruto, man. Yeah, I think Julius <laughs> would be excited. Yeah. As well. Although I have to say that uh, uh, you know this uh, this kind of approach to, to martial arts, uh, uh, you know, comes from uh, from my older kid. You know, so <laughs> he's the expert in in that regard. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> okay. So um, let's get on basically with with your. Um, with your martial arts journey and this time we can elaborate more a little bit more about it okay so when did you start your martial arts journey how did you start who inspired you mm -hmm. okay so um for those who who hadn't seen the um, the, the the previous you know uh, preparatory chat um i got into martial arts in uh maybe some somewhat awkward way you know uh, i wasn't inspired by uh, bruce lee movies or jackie chan or you know whatnot all those usual suspects that you might say N nor did i have anybody um in my family who was into martial arts uh, so that you know i would have that kind of uh closer impact rather um one day on my way back uh from school uh when i was uh, eighth grade uh, i had some exchange money uh, in my pockets, which didn't give me, you know, uh, kept me restless and I <laughs> felt the need to, to get rid of it. So I stopped by the newsstand, you know, being an avid reader since the age of four and a half or five. Uh, you know, I always liked uh, comic books and stuff, but for some reason that day, uh, it was a cover of a martial art magazine that caught my eye. So I decided to buy that instead of whatever was the, the, the newest, you know, comic on the stand. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a national uh, publication uh, back then, but kind of you know a, a, along the format of like you know most of your typical martial art magazines like you know you, you would think of Black Belt or Blitz or you know whatever you know whichever of those uh, international ones. Uh, so you know as I was um, flipping through the pages uh and reading through the articles and a lot of it was of course uh, dedicated to whatever were the results of uh recent competitions and stuff however there were feature articles on uh, various kinds of martial arts uh, and uh practitioners and uh, instructors and legendary figures and so on and so forth uh it piqued my interest enough so that i went out and bought the other one we had two uh basically you know uh coming up uh, back then two monthly magazines 
So mm -hmm. I bought the other one as well and got the ball rolling. Uh, so, you know, uh, on, on the one hand, it gave me some hard of um, insight into the just how rich the whole martial art uh, uh, aspect, you know, can be even uh, in the age before the internet and, and you know, like on YouTube. Uh, so I got at least superficially uh, exposed to quite a lot of uh, various um, arts. And, you know, for one reason or, or another, some of them uh, kept my attention. Uh, so I started looking what was around since uh, I wasn't from the get-go. I, I wasn't really interested in uh, the typical, you know, karate kind of school because I had had uh, uh, an earlier experience with karate when I was uh, probably in my third grade, you know, second and third, uh, and for just you know didn't didn't uh, didn't catch the bug. I, I stayed for uh, more than a year, but in the end. When I had to decide whether I would stay with the uh, national dance troupe or karate, I went with dance, <clears throat> which, okay. like, which continued for the next fifteen years almost. You know, uh, it, it was a parallel career <laughs> uh, for a while. Uh, so, anyways, you know, when I was around fifteen, fourteen, fifteen, um, it, I felt a different, you know, call this time. And the things that I had locally, besides karate, there was this one uh, uh, school that offered the uh, kickboxing and, and French savat instruction brief. Oh, and I really liked savat, you know, uh, looking, you know, you know uh, from the um, uh, taking, a, you know, uh, looking in retrospect, um, it included you know all the tools like you know punching and kicking yeah, and stuff punching and kicking, yeah. yeah uh and but it wasn't um as i don't know how to put it you know as brutish as kickboxing uh may have looked at the time uh somehow it was more technical yeah so that, that, i think i've seen it. some videos of that even yeah. like the sparring they, mm. they are really technical of yeah. course of course back then uh back then it, it, you know again there was no internet to, to just you know check out how things look like you know to see the the, the clips or demos but the emphasis you know since in savat they don't uh, back then kickboxing was essentially either muay thai or full contact you know so mm. you would have the glimmering mm. uh, shiny pants and those uh, uh foot you know foot protectors yeah uh and you know only high kicks above the waist or it was a uh, thai boxing which wasn't really all that popular uh in, in europe at the time uh not outside holland anyway so you know i, I kind of gravitated uh, towards the but uh, the the mm -hmm. the group dwindled really fast in like probably less than six months mm -hmm. however uh at that point i finished uh I finished grade school and uh, started going to high school. And uh, since I was, uh, you know, born and raised in a small town, say 30 kilometers or 20 miles from the capital, uh, I went to the big city to, you know, buy some things that, that, that I needed for school. And I All saw right. the yeah, and then I saw the um, basically the, the posters for. Uh, the Kondo Club that opened, and it happens that I that I knew the coach because uh, I had uh, attended a, uh, a week long the Kondo camp previous summer. Okay, all right. Yeah, so uh, you know, <laughs> basically, you know, m my mom saw that my uh, attention to, to martial arts was somewhat serious, and, and he noticed the the ad for that camp in your you know in daily news one of those inconspicuous you know basic you know urban town uh, reports so he thought i would be interested pointed it to me so you know i joined the seminar i liked the the, the people who were there uh, and started started doing taekwondo for the next 12 years or so 
Okay. Got my black belt and everything. Uh, it was also where I got my first uh, teaching experience. All right. Okay. Because you know, even as a mm -hmm. uh, as a high blue blue belt, I was asked by the club instructors to teach the beginners. You know, mm -hmm. to work with them. Uh, that gave me the, the first uh, exposure to that kind of thing. I got some friends back home interested, so you know uh, they started training as well. Uh, a couple of years later, you know, when I got back from the from the the army, I did my military service in ninety three, ninety four. When I got right. back, yeah, uh, we opened a group or club of our own, and that went on for the next probably you know six or seven years or something. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. To around 2000, 2001. Uh, be as it may, you know, I kept, uh, you know, reading all, all kinds of uh, books, magazines, getting uh, VHS for those, you know, <laughs> who yeah. still remember those, VH tapes of uh, all kinds of um, yeah. stuff that I could, you know, get my hands on just to see yeah. what's out there. Yeah, uh, you started Betamax first and then VHS tapes. Well, you know, Betamax never really uh, caught around here. Well, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that was very popular in the Philippines back then, before the VHS. Yeah. Yeah. Went, yeah. If I understood correctly, it was big in in, in uh, Asia, you know, but not so much, you know, and, uh, <laughs> in Europe. And uh, I don't know about how about the USA, but in Europe, n never really, you know, caught. Anyways, you know, so okay. Uh, yeah, um, I took the opportunity. You know, to contact some people whose books I had, and uh, it put me into experiencing um, Wet Review. You know, it's an Okinawan karate style for, for a couple of uh, years yeah, in, yeah. in mid 90s. And, you know, uh, while training in, in Taekwondo and uh, Wet Review, and, you know, going to see other things here and there, I uh, caught myself kind of gravitating to either very uh modern uh training approaches or the very traditional ones okay yeah uh, probably due to the clarity of their mission i would say so you know if it was a, a modern competing style you had you know more or less a, a clear uh scientific input in the training methods and uh, yeah. motion, both it got me to to really uh appreciate the um, physical conditioning and building the attributes that go with the with the technical you know and uh, training because you know after my first competition when where I think I uh, displayed pretty good technique I got gassed out rather quickly you know after like <laughs> in the middle of the second round I know it's a very common story but you know it, it's not coincidence that it's common yeah yeah, yeah. You know, and you know I I, I just both saw and, and felt my technique really deteriorating rather quickly, you know, due to okay. the uh, lack of conditioning. Yeah. And, you know, it stayed so somewhere in the, in the back of my head, although it took like probably another decade for me to understand that, you know, the attribute work is the part of uh, technical training, you know, because techniques are built not only by the sheer uh, mechanics of movement, the trajectory, but also exactly. by all other um, attributes. Just to give a, uh, an example, you know, you could work, say, you know, on, on a straight punch, like reverse punch or in karate or, or a jab or whatever, you know, and you could really concentrate, you know, at which point does your fist start turning and do you put your... Uh, you know, uh, elbow out elbow or the up. Face, yeah. you know, but if you really work and you could say, okay, see, now it's perfect. But if you, you know, perform it like that, it is perfect. Why? It might be a perfect push. Yep. You know, because <laughs> if you do it slowly, it's a push. It's not a, it's not a punch, is it? So, you know, uh, because it lacks the attribute of speed to generate power. Uh, you know, that kind of Enlightenment came later uh, through my coaching work. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of which, tape, which has tapes and, and you know uh, um, VCRs uh, 
throughout my you know, rummaging for, for trying to see what else is there, that was also my first glimpse into the world of FMA. You know, like, oh, I, see. Okay. like I guess so many other people, uh, I got my hand on the uh, first two volumes of Daniel Santos' uh, series of FMA, you know, the, the early ones that I think is the first series he did. And uh, I like both the presentation and the fact that it was uh, back then, you know, I, I still thought of it uh, as conceptually based. Like, you know, you, you could use the same <laughs> ideas and then yeah. uh, you know, work on, on different applications in, in different situations. So uh, it looked like a really free approach. When I say free, I don't mean uh, uh, free of any restrictions, but rather with the freedom of mind, you know, yeah. uh, inside. But yeah, not tied down to yeah, uh, aside, yeah, but but exactly, but but you know, aside from uh, you know, trying some of the moves on my own and my you know, sometimes uh, making my brothers assist, uh, my brother assist me and you know, okay, uh, yeah, pushing that kind of thing. Um, it, you know, that was the extent of my um, you know exposure. I wouldn't even dare say an experience because it really wasn't one. So you know, a uh, few years later, uh, with the advent of the internet in the late nineties, I think I got my first uh, you know computer with internet connection in ninety eight. Uh, you know, things although with dial up connection and. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sure you know a lot of uh, younger people. Don't you miss the sound of the dial-up? <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe you know. I, I guess the, the the only yeah, I guess the only uh, uh, the only time I still hear it is in my nightmares, you know. But you know, I don't think people will ever uh, understand that kind of suspense. Where, uh, is it gonna you know make it or is it know. Oh, is it gonna break? And then once you establish the connection, you, you pray that. No one else in the household will pick up the phone, you know, and just yeah, exactly, it. exactly. It, it's hard to think that you know back then you would run into files like really small short video clips uh, that were like two megabytes, and you think, yeah, Man, do I even bother to start downloading because you know it, it might break after fifteen minutes, and then you know, and then I just you know wasted fifteen minutes of my internet on you know doing nothing. It, it seems ridiculous now, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you, you remember how, how it worked. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but then again, you know, I started corresponding with, with you know, whoever was uh, willing to respond. And, you know, some people yeah. were uh, uh, responsive and glad to offer their kind of, you know, advice and, and uh, assistance that was possible, you know, through that, you know, basically through exchanging emails, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like I mentioned, uh, uh, during our test run, one of those gentlemen was, was James Keating, uh, Master of Times, uh, you know, James um, Albert Keating, who to this day is, you know, one of my, uh, you know, one of, of members of my pantheon of uh, armed combatives, you know, and, and still an inspiration uh, after... He is very good. He is very yeah, good, James. After a quarter yeah. of a century, yeah. Uh, somewhat... At the same time, somewhat reclusive. On the other hand, very generous w w with his knowledge when he, you know, gets to sharing it. So you know, uh, <clears throat> in two thousand thing, I, I was still doing taekwondo, and uh, yeah, uh, speaking of, of you know, Master Keating, uh, he was so so generous that at one point he sent me a, a knife fighting encyclopedia published back then by another luminary, which is uh, Hawk Hawkeye. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, and he offered uh, uh, some training advice here and there. So I started uh, working on it, although by the late 90s, uh, I discovered Paladin Press. Okay, yes. Yeah. It's a gold mine. Indeed, yes. I discovered Paladin Press and, you know, and... Uh, we first got, uh, you know, by then I was able to have, you know, uh, since uh, I got my credit card and stuff, uh, I was able to, to start ordering stuff. And actually the first structured approach that I tried following on my own that uh, reflects the two FMA was the book by Mike Janich. 
now a former a guest of the FMA discussion. It was his practical course in knife fighting. Yeah, I love his. Yeah, I love yeah. his. Uh, and I worked on that material in earnest. You know, both on my own and with, with partners whenever I could. You know, get those. Uh, having been a by then having uh, been in opportunity to run my own taekwondo classes, I would you know squeeze that kind of material in every now and then when I felt that, that people uh, had enough interest in doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. Uh, but still nothing on, on a major scale. Uh, in 2000, I started training in Russian martial arts. And uh, years later, maybe after 18 months, uh, I got in touch with my uh, still, you know, close friend and one of my most influential mentors in martial arts for the past 20 years and even, you know, uh, even an in-law by now, Alex Kostic of Homo Ludens uh, System of Martial Art. You know, we've been on a path of exploration and trying stuff, uh, you know, uh, together for almost two decades now, you know, uh, his uh, philosophies and, and thinking processes into how do you research and experiment starting, you know, from within yourself and how do you perceive stuff and uh, how you actually have to get something in order to get to get something back in terms of personal investment and, and uh, letting go when you want to learn something new and, and, you know, learning from the embodied perspective and so on and so forth still plays yeah. a major role in how I uh, filter things that I experience today. So uh, it was through through Russian martial arts that in early 2000s, first time in 2004, uh, mm -hmm. I was called to attend a, a seminar in, in France uh, by a bunch of friends. Uh, in 2003, we started uh, running uh, summer camps in, in Russian martial arts uh, here in, uh, in in Serbia, and there were a few, you know, people abroad uh, and coming up, and especially some guys from uh, France. And and uh, during one of those, there was a Swedish guy who mentioned, you know, if you're into FMA, you should check uh, Emmanuel Hart. He is the Inayan representative in in Paris. And there was uh, another guy who said, you know, there is an even better guy that I, I would recommend. I would say, okay, you know, when I get there, you'll have to introduce me, you know, whatever. Mm. Uh, so when I get, uh, uh, I attended the, the weekend seminar, but I stayed for 10 days. So they took me to the gentleman named uh, Daniel Lamak. Uh, All right. Who, who back then was the main European representative of Grandmaster Oliver Barstobal. Uh, from Cebu, who is the the guide of the Arnis Correda Sobramano uh, style, mm -hmm. focusing on, on uh, medio and corto uh, material. Okay. So I uh, trained a bit with him in 2004, and that was a really uh, beautiful experience. You know, uh, all right. I received the instructions to go to, to his uh, club to train with his group. I came, introduced myself, and he asked, would well, you want to sit on the side and watch the class? And, uh, and you know, <laughs> being on a, on a really limited time, I said, no, I'd rather take part, if you don't mind, which he graciously allowed me to do. Uh, and afterwards, he asked, he asked for my phone number, called me a day later or two days later, and asked, would you like a private session? Wow. And I jumped okay. on the opportunity. He picked me up. We went uh, and trained for hours and hours and hours in a local mm -hmm. park. By the time I said, you know what? We need to stop. Because, you know, I'm just, at this point, I'm <laughs> oversight. Information overload. I just, you know, cannot take it anymore. Now, Mr. Lomak is a very intense instructor in terms of, uh, you know, the way he looks at you when working one-on-one -on -one is... You know, he, you feel as as if his gaze is really drilling into you. Mm. But, you know, it really takes a lot of uh, concentration to, to keep up with yeah. his uh, pace of work. I mean, he's challenging, but not overwhelming. He's still there to teach, and very graciously, by the way, you know. As long as you can take, he, he'll be given. 
Yeah. After which he even took me, you know, to, to his home. I met his uh, family. We had a, you know, beautiful evening together. So next year, when I went to France again, this time for a longer stretch, uh, I trained with him again, just, you know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, I really liked uh, both him as a person and what he was, you know, showing me at the time. And, and it wasn't, you know, for the first time, it wasn't some kind of randomly collected bits and pieces from here and there that I was trying to fit into some kind of puzzle, you know. Yeah. Without even knowing if all the pieces are from the same set, you know, or are they even possible to, to be put together. Yeah. And then in 2006, I brought him over to, to Serbia to teach a seminar, and he also stayed for a few days to, to do privates, and that was uh, another great uh, experience. So, you know, uh, I really, you know, got my feet wet in, in the right way in, in that uh, regard. He expanded a little bit uh, on the original Corrida uh, Sobramano uh, material because, and this is a great story, it, it gave me uh, an uh, insight into how honest and open minds think, saying that, you know, since the style is not unlike Balintovac. I think that the founder of the style, once Andres Gomba, uh, even traded in Balintovac, you know, uh, All right, okay. back on making <coughs> or something. So uh, as Dan was sitting waiting for his own class back in the early 90s or something, or uh, it was preceded by a kendo class. Okay. And this guy's, you know, sparring in, in, in kendo rules and thought himself, thought he, how would I deal with this kind of energy and commitment? You know, when, when a person mm -hmm. just, you know, runs in without, you know, without caring about not being hit or something, just, you know, it got him into, into thinking, you know, would I really be able, you know, to, to do the, the block and trap and pass and stuff, you know, when something just tries to, to run you over? Yeah, yeah. And it, uh, it uh, put him on the path of uh, kind of creating his own, Largo subset of the style, which he called Calavera Esprima. So in the end, he, he ended up having a, what he called the, the Tres Flores Corredas Arnis. Tres Flores basically standing for three ranges, you know, Largo. Three ranges, and, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> which he called, which he called uh, 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 Largo and uh, Sabon Serrada and Esprima de Salon, being the. Oh, the, okay. Or he also called it El Mirador. Yeah, and really, you know, uh, great material. And I, back then, I ended up even writing an article about Tres Flores Corredas uh, for um, Mr. Dowd's uh, now defunct FMA Digest. Yeah. Oh, did you? Uh, All right. Yeah, yeah. Published author <laughs> in FMA. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and that same year, 2006, brought in another major... Uh, development, you know. Okay. <clears throat> because uh, this is when uh, this seminal work <laughs> by Master Ray Galang was published, Master of the Blade. Right? Okay. So I got it, uh, I wrote the book, and, uh, you know, I really liked the content presentation, instructors, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, getting this book was a uh, uh, really important for my further uh, engagement in FMA in more than one way. First, it, you know, got me understand for the first time, aha, okay, I think this is the style or the system that I would like really to focus on. Why? Because uh, as I, you know, went through the material for, uh, for a few weeks, tried several things here and there, you know, because at that point I already had a, a, group, of, a group of people who, who, you know, wanted to train in FMA. Some of them, you know, you know most of them actually had the previous uh, Jeet Kune Do background from a local uh, group, and I got friendly with them and started training with them. You know, so, so there was some regularity in doing uh, FMA there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I tried to, to figure out some kind of um, sequence of how best to use the material in, in, in the book, right? Okay. I sat down and, and wrote uh, a post about it for uh, one of the 
my forums back then, Blade forums or whatever it was called. But then, you know, as I was reading through through, through my own post, I, you know, uh, so I saw uh, it clicked to me. Now wait a minute. Almost all of these guys come from Lomeco. You know, and that's, hmm, you know, got me thinking. Yeah. What, what is it about it that, that, you know, made me really like their contributions to, to, to the book? Um, and, you know, since obviously, you know, the, the, all the, the, the instructors in the book are um, featured in the alphabetical order. However, the first one being one, Roger Agbulos. Okay, this is not uh -huh. the original book, right? <laughs> Which, yeah. So, uh, and, <laughs> and his, his chapter in the book is focused on, on footwork and distance management and uh, economy of motion. And so, as I wrote my post, uh, I said that I think it was great that the book opened with such a great presentation on such an important uh, uh, piece of material yeah <clears throat> yeah lo and behold guru roger was a member of the forum so oh, he, okay so he shot me a private message we started exchanging messages uh and then he went an extra mile and asked for my phone number which i provided thinking you know what he's in california i'm all the way in europe but god knows you know i uh, uh, Still, didn't think too much about you know uh, personal uh, personal uh, information protection online and stuff back then, right? It wasn't such a big deal. And then he gave me a call, you know, out of the blue. So we spent some time, you know, talking on the phone, and uh, I don't know somehow we clicked right then and there. All right. And I asked him if he would um, to be my you know long distance mentor in my efforts to, to work uh, saying I do understand that is is a really suboptimal approach to doing it you not being here in person right but at least you are someone with a deep insight into yes. how things are supposed sure. to be done so I'd yeah. rather <clears throat> take a longer more painstaking path but knowing that I'm on the right path then still you know uh, Kind of you know wandering around and doing that kind of thing, he graciously accepted me as a quasi student, right? In, in that regard, and keep in mind it was before uh, Facebook and uh, you know before uh, Skype, fiber, you know, before cable, <laughs> cable internet and that kind of thing. So sometimes we would manage to hook up on the Yahoo Messenger, which had oh, video. Oh yeah, 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 uh, Yahoo Messenger. Back yeah, then. yeah. Uh, where he would show me what I need to work with, uh, work on, and then I would for the, for you know time, and then I would just basically uh, make a video of myself, burn it on a, on a DVD, and you know send it over, and then wait for his uh, feedback. And you know uh, now the, it looks. Like something of a karate kid kind of thing, you know, because, uh, you know, again, with respect, I didn't really question he, his decisions back then, uh, uh, but I did some thinking. He gave me, like, you know, one piece of footwork and mm -hmm. said, okay, for the next period, I want you to, you know, work on these three uh, guard positions, you know, Central, Serrada, and Abierta, and do this, you know, uh, Footwork and work on it. Just work it well, in three-minute rounds. You know, each guard. You know, and just first, just you know, making sure that everything is in its right place when it comes. Always paying attention to how your, whether your yeah. knees are, are bent, whether your hips are aligned. You know, that everything is in place. I did. It took on, and then he slowly introduced without even going with you know angles of attack and anything he just introduced basic strikes almost you know as, as if working okay now jab yeah, yeah, yeah. position you know going from central going from uh, 
the Rabda, growing from Abierta. He explained the details, of course, and then I went through that and how to include distance management into it. And for, I don't know how long, but the thing is that for, for quite a while, you know, basically I only worked on those three strikes or the same strikes, you know, on, on a couple different planes. Uh, but it showed effective, inspiring. You know, instead, first of all, I didn't have to think, okay, what am I going to try next and how to, you know, I just was, you know, going the material I had at the uh, disposal, right? You know, so one step at a time, <clears throat> it was going like that. I liked the, the work. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, I guess he, you know, he started at one point sharing more whether it was because I was progressing or because I showed enough uh, commitment to what we were doing, you know, uh, so he, and it went on like that for a couple of years and then, um, well, couple, couples of years. And then, uh, we finally got the opportunity to, to meet in person. All right. Uh, during his uh, seminar in, in Holland. Okay. And, you know, uh, it was an I interesting, you know, when we actually met, it was like, you know, meeting a, a, you know, a relative you, you really haven't seen for a long time because, you know, yeah. uh, it was a really, felt like a reunion. So, you know, we went on, we were able to meet every year for a few years afterwards, you know, uh, in right. Holland and then in Serbia and then in Belgium and then in Serbia again. So, you know, that kind of thing. And in the meantime, I was also able to attend two seminars with uh, Guru Dave Gould, another, oh, member, yeah. okay. another member of the Solite Original Backyard Group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their approaches were obviously really complementary, you know, fit together. Uh, and, you know, while working with uh, Guru Roger, uh, I asked him what was the... the you know, real foundation of his, you know, uh, approach to, to his interpretation of Lomeco. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I uh, studied under Irene Olavides, so it would be the Campo, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Guru Dave, in his uh, writing of his articles, uh, both online and, and in martial art magazines that uh, were published here in Europe, was also, you know, very uh, obviously, you know, uh, commanding of uh, of the campo. And prior to attending the uh, Guru Dave's uh, seminar in, in in Frankfurt in Germany, I asked him, you know, via email, if you know, since I had some time over, you know, after the seminar, if he would uh, take me for a private lesson to work on the campo. Which he did. So again, a few hours uh, uh, spent in uh, hard work and, you know, some pain, you know, and, you know, first guesting blisters and then bursting the blisters and you know, the, how it goes. It was tough, but I really, you know, loved every second of it. Uh, and at this point, uh, I think it, um, it is worthwhile mentioning, although I was really ready and willing to pay for my private instruction. The same as happened with, with, uh, with uh, Guru Dan Lamak in, in France. They asked, no, 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 no need. Just the very fact that you, you know, wanted yeah, to do yeah. it uh, and showed commitment, <laughs> it was and then uh, it only made me appreciate the stuff even more. I know that, you know, uh, in the modern day, people have the tendency to not really appreciate the stuff that comes for free. Because yeah, that's true. Taken that's for granted, true. right? But you know, uh, coming from the background where the access to good instruction and good instruction was so scarce, yeah, I was really, you know, willing to go the extra miles or ten to to you know to get that instruction. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, stay with Guru Roger uh, ever since. Uh, and started uh, teaching on my own. And I think, you know, that 
teaching really is the next step in one's uh, learning uh, progression. Yeah. Because obviously it makes you think about the material uh, from a different perspective in a different way, trying to deconstruct what you've been told and why is it done that way and so on and so forth. And, you know, having thought, uh, having been an instructor in, in Taekwondo, obviously, you know, helped with the, with all that, you know, and, uh, and that is actually where, where my um, focus uh, lays. Because uh, nowadays, I don't really appreciate uh, styles or systems or schools, you know, whatever you want to call them, by uh, what declaratively they offer, you know, by the size of the curriculum or by yeah. the all-encompassing <laughs> nature of the approach, but rather by the quality of instruction. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, like I said, even though I noticed early that I gravitated to the two, you know, opposite poles of the, of the continuum, very modern or very traditional, at the point, you know, uh, uh, I also started questioning things like, and figuring that all approaches are pretty much valid, as long as both the practitioner and the instructor are aware of what is the driving motivation behind the training and that they're honest with it. Yeah. You know, some That's people the, yeah. have the need for real, practical, you know, uh, street brawling self-defense skills, right? And obviously, uh, <clears throat> they probably won't find it in uh, a strictly sportive taekwondo school, right? Or... Uh, or a strictly traditional Aikido school or, or whatnot, simply because there are so many uh, aspects to doing it. And I yeah. have absolute appreciation for any and all schools and uh, that choose one aspect to focus on. If it's some kind of you know anthropological, ethnological, folkloric study that you simply have to be focusing on, on this aspect of the anthropological study that is you know, uh, uh, martial practices and, you know, uh, hoplology, basically, you know, if you want to call it that way, I'm fine with it. As long as we're on the same page, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, as, 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 much as, as much as I like capoeira for its, uh, you know, uh, physical culture uh, qualities and aspects and the great atmosphere that they, you know, have in, uh, in the groups and it's uh, very interesting uh, also cultural exclusion. I wouldn't send a person who needs a real hands-on uh, self-defense fight approach there. You know. Yeah, yeah, On yeah. On the other yeah. hand, if you want to learn about, you know, traditions and care about the lineage and stuff, I probably wouldn't send that person to a Krav Maga school. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah like exactly, that. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Essentially, you know what I mean. In, yeah, in, in Guru Roger, I found that the very practical, functional approach. I call my, you know, I, I call myself a contextual functionalist. Mm -hmm. You know, within the context, it has to work for me. Again, mm -hmm. I, I'm not putting down anybody who has other needs and desires. Just for me, it has to work in a certain context, which have, you know, which is what it is. Yeah, you know, I started thinking, what is it that appeals to me in in uh, in the astig approach to to FMA, right? And taking a look back at the progression of my training under Guru Roger and under his guidance, I kind of recognize, well, wait a minute, what he did resembles what I think is a boxing approach to training. You know, let's take a compact. If you want to call it a limited number of, of technical, you know, uh, options, and work on it to develop it and functionalize it. So you know, okay, let's just start with with a broken strike in these three positions. But learn how to control the distance, how yes. to deliver the strike, 
how to avoid the you know countries stay in the largo range what does it mean uh how do you achieve this you know uh yeah. staying in the largo range and so on and so forth and then then maybe introduce another technical element another tool and then go through the same process until it's yeah. functional like, until it's part of your game yeah and i really really yeah. like it because uh in early 2000s uh as you know a lot like i said i was working on my uh fma with the people from jkd and my my uh you know friend and instructor alex who, who worked with me on the russian martial art uh he also had the opportunity to, to train in bjj back in canada where he was based at the time so we introduced that obviously you know by the time we were all uh, aware of, of gracies and bjj and mma and stuff yeah. so i got into mma as well you know there was this period of my life uh my work was a uh, very uh well approving you know in terms of i there was like three years between, say, 2003 and 2006, maybe 2007, that yeah. I was able to train for like 25, 26, 7 hours a week. Okay. You know, so, wow. Yeah, day in, day out, you know. So uh, I, it just happened that I had both time and resources, you know, to do it. And uh, I did it all. I competed. I had, you know, a couple of MMA uh, fights, you know, uh, a month before my 30th mm -hmm. birthday, you know, I remember coming back to work, uh, you know, a couple of days later with, uh, you know, a couple of bruises and, and stuff. And the co-worker was like, uh, what was that? Because, you know, she, she knew I, I, I wasn't the guy who goes to bars and do that kind of stuff. And I explained what I did. And it was like, but why? <laughs> you know, and, and joking, I said, I don't know, maybe it's a pending midlife crisis. You know, I'm you know, <laughs> at the verge of turning 30, you know, so. But basically, you know, my line of thinking, <clears throat> uh, like this particular fight, I was called to to, uh, to do a fight like three days before because they had oh, a fight okay. to cancel, you know. And I was thinking, you know what? I wasn't really preparing, although I was constantly in training, obviously. I wasn't really preparing, but then again, you know, I'm almost 30. If not now, when? When, yeah, that's so, true. Okay, so I said, you know what? Let's do it, you know. It was an old school approach, no time limits, just, you know, go till, you know, till, till uh, someone taps. And believe it or not, we had a draw fight. It was kind of puzzling, but <laughs> uh, we were the first fight of the tournament or the, 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 the evening, you know, it wasn't a tournament. It was individual fights. And I think the organizers got scared that, you know, if all fights go go the long distance it, it would turn you know they, they would probably you know uh, break the, the the lease on the on the hole and everything so you know after yeah, 15 yeah, yeah. minutes they just you know pull us up <laughs> and declare it a draw <laughs> i was you know yeah i, I was you know i worked uh, it was my first fight against a guy who already had a couple of tournaments under his belt uh, an experienced kickboxer experience and mma fight and so you know in the end i was pretty satisfied with my you know uh outcome with your performance, yeah, with the outcome, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I tried it. <clears throat> had another amateur later for a, for a victory, you know. But you know, uh, at the time, I actually had some sort of game, you know, knew how to deal with the with the other person. But you know, also yeah. it it made me learn what does it mean to, you know, uh, underestimating your opponent opponent is is an easy thing to 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 grasp, right? You know, yeah. you underestimate and then they, you know, uh, they catch you unexpectedly. In this case, I was overestimating my opponent, you know, a much more oh, okay. skilled guy, uh, a kickboxer at that. I tried to, to wrestle, to, to wrestle and go to ground with him. My first time, you know, going, you know, shirtless, you know, I was having a hard time getting grips with first time with the, you know, uh, bandages and stuff. He would, you know, pull out. By the time uh, I, figured out, you know what, I could actually, you know, kickbox against this guy. You know, I had the reach advantage, he was shorter and stuff. You know, by the time I, you know, got to my senses and tried to work that, you know, that they, they stopped the fight. So I was thinking, you know, maybe, you know, I underestimated myself, myself, overestimated yeah, the guy. Yeah. Should have, you know, changed my approach earlier, but, you know, basically no regards, it was a lesson learned.
and yeah, that's true. And not not paid too expensively, so you know, uh, something that I you know uh, that was in my mind later. So yeah, yeah. something to, to do it. Uh, yeah. So you competed in taekwondo. Yes. You competed in MMA. Yes. And you said you also competed in sanda. Yes. The the Jitkundo group that I you know trained with, uh, they were affiliated with this uh, you know, Kung Fu Federation uh, here in Serbia, and they had a uh, Sanda tournament. And since you know this <clears throat> this group club had nobody in this particular weight class, they asked me, you know, you know why not? Would you like to join? I said, so, yeah, why not? Sure. <clears throat> no problem. Uh, so you know, uh, I like the format. I have to say, you know, uh, you know kickboxing with clinch and throws without you know ground it, it, it's um i think it's a very uh spectator uh alluring thing you know it, it's a dynamic fights people still do understand what they see you know because you know in the early days of MMA, people really didn't understand uh, uh you know grappling on the ground i'm not yeah. sure uh, uh, i'm not sure even if a lot of you know, MMA fans and UFC viewers these days even understand it, you know, and I think it's reflected in the rules. Shorter rounds where after a period of an inactivity on the floor, the, you know, uh, the fighters are dropped back uh, on their feet and so on. Because it may, I ended up uh, taking a goal in that tournament, in that Sanda. But again, in all honesty, in the final match, uh, I was pitted uh, against a guy who I think was a better fighter, but it just so mm -hmm. happened that, that he injured, you know, himself in one of the exchanges. He he stepped awkwardly, uh, injured his ankle, so he forfeited the fight. I ended up taking, oh. the you know, uh, I don't know how it would. It was early in the fight, like mid first round, you know. I, I can't say for for sure uh, where it would take us, but I think he was a, a he was a better, more well rounded, <laughs> you know, fighter with with better attributes at the time. Oh, okay, but you know, so there you have. Sometimes you, you, you're just lucky. You know, it, it, it's yeah. another factor to yeah. take in, into consideration. You know, yeah. like yeah. it or not, you know, the luck plays its its role. Yeah, and yeah. then yeah, I also had the opportunity to uh, in 2010, uh, I went to this uh, training camp in Slovenia, uh, primarily because one of the well. The main feature instructor was uh, Guru Crafty Dog, Mark Denny of, of Dog Brothers. Okay. Yeah, so obviously I wanted to, to you know, uh, since he was in my neck of the woods, I wanted to take the opportunity. He turned out to be a really great gentleman and uh, with a wicked sense of humor that I really like. Um, you know, for one reason or another, you know, uh, the friend, the, the head of the JKD school that you know, I trained with, we went together, uh, and probably being, having been two guys who, who, <clears throat> uh, traveled the longest distance, you know, Guru Crafty spent the first week prior to the camp, just sitting, you know, chatting with us, telling jokes, <laughs> some yeah. of them probably not, not to be repeated, uh, publicly, but he is his way, you know, uh, and, you know, his, his teaching style, I, I really like he, he was, Again, very uh, unselfish with uh, sharing his information. Uh, by then, he really had his uh, uh, similar teaching style honed mm -hmm. then, and going smoothly. And there were some other interesting people I met there, one of them being John Escudero. Uh, oh, okay. So that's where you met Angel, John. Yeah. yeah. Angel <laughs> Garcia was also there. All right. We okay. Oh. Together with another. Uh, Alan from your uh, show, which would be John's wife, Neta, right? Yeah. Back yeah. then, they, they, were, they still weren't married, but, you know, uh, so, you know, I met the whole gang <laughs> and uh, got to like them, really. They were, you know, probably one of those uh, unexpected uh, uh, bonuses back then. And, uh, you know, Master John was really uh, nice in, in having talk and... Um, answering some of my questions and, and some of my inquiries, you know, uh, yeah. getting some of my 
uh, dilemmas uh, resolved for me and so on. I really hooked up nicely with the, with Angelo because we were, you know, both musicians who with similar likes and so on. So, you know, and uh, another really great surprise was uh, Alex mm. Ulesnia called the act armed combatant tactics. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, not exactly FMA, but, you know, I think sort of <coughs> at least influenced by, if nothing else, mm. very functional guys with the yeah, strong yeah. on sparring. You yeah, know, I've Alex seen some was, of their videos. Mm. Yeah, Alex was, Actually. you know, one of those uh, rude awakening type of guys. You know, sparring with him, you know, it was like, for me, it was... Uh, uh, another lesson learned experience, you know, uh, I have this very offensive style, which, you know, 10 years ago, uh, sometimes could be reckless, and it really uh, made his counter uh, style shine, you know, so, you know, he really made an example out of me <laughs> on what things should or shouldn't be done when uh, right. meeting, you know, someone, so, you know, uh, we, you know, we remain friends and I really like him to, to, to the state. So, you know, uh, but the point of that training camp with, with several featured instructors, again, it brought uh, to attention different uh, <laughs> teaching and coaching approaches. Yeah. <laughs> and being a school teacher myself, I take Again, this whole methodology thing really seriously. This is yeah. sort of my pet peeve with a lot of martial arts schools, you know, regardless of, of what they teach, but FMA included. Some people are yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, kind of haphazard in what they do. Almost like, you know, buffet, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So, you know, we all talk um, with, you know, more or less disdain about... Uh, technique collectors and I'm not a fan of that approach myself again I don't yeah. mind that approach mm -hmm. if they are honest with themselves that you know what is instead of collecting you know stamps or napkins or whatever I'm going out and collecting martial art techniques you know yeah a lot yeah, of yeah, them yeah. are completely unrelated and really incompatible but you know okay if it works you both I'm fine with it. as long as you know, you don't uh, get out of your lane while doing it. That's true. Know? That's true. You know, so, so uh, along the, the, the way, I figured out that a lot of people have no idea what the difference is between being an instructor and being a coach. Yeah, you know? that, is uh, that is true. Yeah. And I met some people who are nice guys having schools, but they're obsessing over facts such as syllabuses and curriculum, you know, curricula. Uh, so they, in, they, in their view, it's all about what your curriculum is and how do you sequence, you know, the, the steps in presenting the material. But it doesn't work, you know, that way. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, again, as somebody with 20 years of, you know, uh, school teaching experience and high, uh, in, from levels, you know, grade one elementary school to grade 12, you know, the, the end yeah. of high school, I can yeah. tell you for a fact that just having a clear cut curriculum and a program of, you know, how the units are strung together, you know, it's not a guarantee of uh, a successful outcome, you know. Yep, exactly. Because if it were, we wouldn't have A students and D students, right? Yeah. Or, you know, by now in martial arts, somebody would have stumbled on the right curriculum to, to you know, to, to have a conveyor belt and producing effective fighters. But again, yeah. it doesn't work this way, right? Mm -hmm. Even in a, in surroundings where you are in it from the day one, such as boxing, how big is the percentage of guys who actually end up being successful professionally, let alone being world champions or something, but 
actually, you know, being you know, having considerably more victories than losses in the career. Yeah. And then, can you name one coach who produced 20 such fighters? No. You know, like, okay, there are names out there, such, such as Freddie Roach, you know, yeah. obviously a, a successful coach who, who had uh, some champions. Uh, but even the coaches, you know, who are champion coaches, you know, we can talk about Angel Dundee and Cas Diamato and Freddie Roach and Teddy Atlas. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Even so, how many <coughs> of them groomed their fighters from the day one beginner to the championship level? You know, a lot of them actually get experienced practitioners, and but yeah. why? Because they're not there to be teachers and instructors they are there to be coaches, coaches. Yeah. So, yeah so where does it put us you know uh some people will tell you you know readily recognize that you have <clears throat> more seminar oriented instructors and kind of club group oriented instructors you know one yeah. of them selling in one way or the other uh so that should be, you know, indicative of, of, of certain things, right? Uh, so, you know, while instructors are basically people who, who are really focused on curriculums and yes. teaching the material, the coaches are actually concerned with teaching or actually training the person. It's yeah. more about the, the practitioner than the material yeah the, the it's, it's more like or enhancing their performance. i mean obviously yeah. at that point material is important because but you <clears throat> adapt the, the the material and the curriculum and whatever is there to the actual person instead yeah. of trying to have a mill like i said conveyor belt of you know x yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, random number of people who can all demonstrate equal proficiency in the chosen material you know because at the end of the day if if our goal is to have functional fighters yeah then really having everybody demonstrating <laughs> equal proficiency in the same amount of material is, is a moot point yeah you know, exactly like, you know some people you know people have different attributes mental physical so on and so forth and as a coach, you would be amiss trying to impose your own game and view on the person before you, right? So you have to, to work mm. to bring their best yes, instead exactly. of, you know, model them into something that they're not meant to be. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, at one point, when you get really uh, critical in terms <laughs> of honesty, you see that some people end up being really good at what they do, not thanks to, to their training methods, but actually in spite of yeah, the training yeah. methods that yeah, were yeah. supposed to, you know. Some people are superb specimens that will thrive in, you know, uh, almost any uh, environment, but some people need to, I, I, I honestly and sincerely believe mm. that most people can be trained into uh good exponents of, of what they do if worked on personally now of course there are some you know systems and schools out there who really got to do you know in terms of having a curriculum uh, as a set guidelines and coaching <laughs> together again Balintawak would be a good point, you know, because it's a really very much one-on-one -on -one teaching style with, with the Palakau and, uh, and Agak practices, yeah. right? So there is a, in, in the group system, there is a pretty clear uh, progression through the material. The program is fairly uh, organized. Mm -hmm. It's not stiff or, or anything, but it's fairly organized. You, you know, this is the first phase and then the phase two, three, you yeah, know, exactly. yeah. you know, group one, two, three, 76, whatever, you know, one way. But by working one on one and always being under the critical, you know, tutelage of an of, uh, instructor who, by, by the uh, sheer 
fact of working one on one also happens to be a coach because he is commenting in real time. Yeah. As you do it, it's a, I think it, it, it's a pretty good approach to, to do it. Now, it is, the yeah. thing is that in order to be an effective, <clears throat> well, both instructor and a coach, but especially coach, there is so much stuff to think about mm. and to have a grasp of, you know. And uh, to find it all in one person is not impossible, but such great instructors <laughs> are few and far between, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, some of them then, you know, uh, are particularly uh, effective and good in, in portraying one or more aspects of the overall, you know, uh, fight game. One of the most interesting uh, people I, I got to meet and nowadays call my friend is Luis Preto. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. An instructor and coach of, of uh, Jogo de Pau, which is a traditional Portuguese staff and stick uh, fighting method. Now, yeah, you know, Luis, works, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Luis is not just a you know, uh, guy who happens to you know, be good at it and having done it for you know, uh, a long, long time. But he actually got two master degrees in coaching and in sports science. Ah, okay. That's and, good. Yeah, and he was able to really uh, bring that knowledge and expertise into creating an excellent, excellent training program. You know, ah, uh, okay. I first got exposed to, to, to Loish's work, you know, through, through his first book. And then during one of those uh, Russian martial art summer camps, I met a Portuguese guy who had happened to, to, to have known Luis and, you know, uh, and had trained with him. So he, when he went back home, he said, you know, there's a nerd in Serbia who heard of you, believe it or not, you know. Uh, and Luis himself, being a sort of a martial art nerd, was, you know, intrigued by this guy's uh, telling about me. And, you know, lo and behold, next year for the summer camp, Luis comes. So, you know, he wanted oh, okay. to try that, why not? So, so he came over, we spent, you know, uh, aside from the regular uh, Russian staff training every day, we went out and worked on the <coughs> Jogo de Pau. And then next year, the following year, uh, it was in 2013 and 14, uh, Luis needed some time in, in, in uh, Reckless to work on, uh, on, on some of his books. So I rented an apartment for him and he came and stayed in, you know, in my like 15 minutes walk uh, for me yeah, for yeah, eight yeah. weeks. For, and it was, you know, eight weeks of really intensive and extensive wow. training. I really got to, to pick his brain and, and understand. And let me tell you, you know, um, I would say that uh, when it comes to really dialing in your, uh, teaching and coaching approach, Luis, uh, you know, in terms of having it all figured out and put into writing and, and uh, rational, you know, and out. Yeah. Luis and Tom <clears throat> are probably the two best guys I have met so far. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Luis coming from the phenomenological yeah. part yeah. Of, of how the fight unfolds, yeah. What is uh, a uh, fight and then builds his technical and even, you know, teaching, technical, uh, tactical teaching approach, starting with, okay, what happens in a fight? How, would it, how do we deconstruct those events? Like, for example, for everybody who is really uh, into how to, to teach people what is the, the, the right, proper, uh, right proper way to, to follow the, the progression, you know, this book is hard to beat. You know, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see, this is how you spell his name, right? If you want to yeah, look yeah. up his, his material online, I, I can't recommend this enough, you know, uh, and awesome stuff. In this, you, you really see not only what to do, when and how, but also why on each of those. Why that? Why in that order? And why in that way? Mm. 
<clears throat> it really goes into the nitty gritty of how to make the learning and training experience as effective and efficient as possible. Yeah. And okay. then uses a similar approach if you know to, to build his uh, fighter, his trainees into decision process. Okay. You know, the, the whole point of you know about fighting is about making decisions in in what could yeah. be described as a crisis situation, right? Fluid, like so. You know, then this one. I I I hope you know you don't mind the plot here. That is fine. Yeah. But uh, okay, you know, it's stick fighting. You know, so yeah. it's it's a uh, if not FMA family, then it's relatives, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, Excellent, excellent approach. Now, I'm really, on the other hand, I mentioned Tom Sotis of, of Amok, another alum of uh, the, the early, uh, in the early episodes uh, of FMA discussion. Uh, he starts from a different point in order to really work on, you know, to establish the proper attitude and mindset because all the technical training and, and Coaching isn't going to do you much good. Yeah. If you then, you know, uh, people talk about the, the, the physical attributes as the uh, fuel that runs you, your techniques, right? Uh, but uh, I, I'd say that working physical attributes is the engine, mindset is the fuel. The mindset is the fuel, yeah. You know, if there's no <clears throat> gas in your engine, you know. Forget it. That's it. I mean, it, it can be a Ferrari or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, monster truck, but if, if your, you know, a gas tank is empty, you know, it's not going to do much good, right? So, you know, yeah. in that regard, uh, um, you know, Tom's book, his, his uh, Manifesto of Invisibility, unfortunately, I only <laughs> had it in, uh, in a Kindle <laughs> format, so I cannot wave it. Sorry, Tom, <laughs> if you're watching. Uh, Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my copy. <laughs> yeah, I know you do have it. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I, another absolutely phenomenal book, a must read if you're into into being an instructor. You know, even if, of course, you know, if you're into into fighting in in any way, shape, or form. But if you're an instructor, it's a must read, an absolute. Yeah, actually. And then, see, in that regard, um, this is how you know all the benefits that come from from internet when when it comes to training. You see. Uh, I took part in the, the first um, sweepstakes that, that Dean organized, that the FMA discussion organized, you know, the... the, the oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and basically, you know, I, I was uh, having a personal, uh, a personal online lesson with, with uh, Tom Sotis was one of the uh, awards. Basically, that was the only one I was really hoping for since I already had had a book. And, you know, I mentioned uh, when you got the, the, the book, when you got that particular, you know, award, uh, I commented, ah, damn, you know, I was so happy <laughs> to this one, it's too bad, you know, it's the only one that, yeah. And, you know, uh, from the left field, Mr. Sotis contacted me a couple of days later and said, you know what, you know, you, you wrote a you know, nice review of my book, so I might as well, <laughs> you know. Uh, no, it was it about. was it was it was a very enlightening um, discussion with him actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and we we stayed in touch. Had quite a few discussions later as well, and you know, it, it's discussions. You know, you know, light bulbs firing so, so rapidly. You know, uh, I was at one point afraid I might get a, a, a an epileptic. You know, fit from all those lights. <laughs> you know, going going on. Yeah, so, uh, so Loisha and, and, and Soris are but two of, of examples of a people who are really took the time and yeah. effort to organize and coherently uh, explain their approach and their training system. And yeah. in, in which cases, it really is a training system. Mm -hmm. Not just uh, random, you know, throwing da darts in the, in the dark room and hoping for the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, it happens sometimes. <coughs> and speaking of which, you know, uh, internet is also great and showed its great capacity as the pandemic 
he does uh, it really opened up a lot of doors because a lot of instructors that previously were uninterested or reluctant yeah. about <clears throat> teaching online decided to actually go forward and try it. Yeah. I mean, for we, we, you know, you and I, we already talked about how great it is to, to uh, <clears throat> have our such days starting in the morning with, with uh, training with the with Michael Ray Galang of Bakpakan and then uh, wrapping it up with, with the Aztec sessions with, with the Guru yes. Roger, right? Yeah. Uh, I have to say, you know, Guru Roger was probably, you know, a, a leader of the pack in that because I think very first week uh, as the pandemic was uh, uh, declared and, you know, the, the world was shut down in lockdown and stuff, I think the very same week or, or, or the next one, he had his first and kept doing it day, you know, week in, week out. I know. You know, I know. just completely <laughs> phenomenal in, in that way. And, you know, it I was know. a blessing in disguise and a real silver uh, thread in this whole uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, uh, having an access <laughs> and seeing how things are built upon, you know, how the building blocks actually follow yeah. each other. And how to work on those attributes that that you know, that run the, the techniques is a great yeah. stuff. And you know, Roger being one of those completely you know uh, functional guys in his approach that just fits with, with my uh, view is awesome. You know? Yeah. That said, uh, I mentioned myself as as a contextual functionalist. People might get a Ask you, okay, but how does it fit with your inclination to, towards, you know, completely, you know, like, to the traditional thing? Traditional, uh, yes. I think actually learning <clears throat> about some people think that, that learning about uh, you know history and culture and traditions of uh, school is a waste of time if you are into the function. But I beg to differ. Yeah. If you actually, you know, because if you just come in with a. Uh, uh, synchronic uh, view, okay, you know, this is where we're in 21st century, and uh, you end up asking yourself, where does this technique come from? And what the heck, you know, why is, what is, it, what is it, what kind of purpose does this serve? But if you start digging deeply and, and you know, uh, again, authentically into the background, a lot of those answers a lot of those questions get answered and a lot of pieces fall into place because yeah. we figure, ah, okay, they used to wear an armor or at least they had a harness or, mm. oh, they walked barefooted. Oh, imagine that, you know, hence the footwork or this and that. A lot of yeah. those, again, uh, you know, answers kind of start popping out. Uh, so you start appreciating the, the, the material more. Even if yeah, you don't see it as, as relevant, but at least you know why things are You get there. to understand why, yes. Yeah. And while we are at the topic, uh, there is this uh, popular debate about is there a, a, any place for su stuff such as, you know, cyclical drills, you know, hubad or, or sombreras or cinevale patterns and so on and so forth. Uh, in one's training if they are looking to, to improve as, as functional fighters. And first of all, uh, the fact is, I have really strong suspicions about how some of those drills came to be. Okay. You know, uh, some of the instructors, typically the lazy ones, you know, uh, stemming from the technique collector uh, bunch will say, you know, it's a, it's a tradition, so we do it. I'm not entirely, uh, I'm not really appreciated. Uh, my take, um, you know, I, I would really like, you know, some of the, 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 the Manons to correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that a lot of those were actually at one point uh, made to just illustrate a certain point probably mm -hmm. uh, probably one of those underlying principles 
you know, not necessarily finer technical details or, or uh, you know, uh, so, but some of those, you know, conceptual principles that, that are in, in the background, in the software of, of yeah. uh, a system or, or a school. But for one reason or another, you know, some of the practitioners uh, conflated the, the means to an end with an end itself. So they that, started yep, yeah. drilling for the sake of drilling. They, you know, stop seeing <coughs> uh, beyond the, the the appearance into yeah. the principles, and the, and just started, you know, going through the movements, sometimes absent-mindedly, you know, and then it, then obviously it loses its purpose, and <clears throat> and gives what we do a bad name. You know, like, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was yeah. a there was a period when I completely dropped all kind of you know, uh, uh you know, drills and anything. But then, Guru Roger comes uh, for his first seminar in Serbia, and since you know we had him for a few days more than a typical weekend seminar elsewhere, he's he said no, but I do it. I was like, really, you do? Why? And he said, okay, let's do it. And oh, you know, all of a sudden, it's not the, the actual you know, Huba that you see in YouTube and stuff, but it actually looks and it feels more like when the wrestlers do pummeling. That's true, at, yeah. At the beginning of his training. So uh, all of a sudden, you're not standing in place and doing, you know, patty cake. You're actually work, working your Moving. hands off. Wor yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah to, to maintain distance, to, to <laughs> respond to an actual, you know, uh, mm energy you know if yeah. somebody's trying to get through your structure to maintain the structure and maintain the defense or if you're trying to go through theirs to actually work to mm. uh, achieve your goal yeah. and you know all of a sudden it takes a different um <clears throat> a different dimension you know and especially if, if you start you know uh deconstructing and picking things apart you start seeing what went into building it, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's not so much about the drills as much as it is about how they're done. Yep. But how they're done uh, is predicated uh, majorly on understanding what they're meant to achieve. So yes. if you don't, then you might as well not do it, right? Same with, with forms. You know, why is, you know, I, I used to have a love-hate relationship with, with, you know, forms and kata forms. and stuff in, in uh, yeah, in training. Uh, you know, but there are a lot of great aspects. As one, a lot of people, when left to their own devices, would probably have no clue about what to do, but if the system, whether it's karate or taekwondo or silat or, you know, whatever, least, if there is a form in the system, they at least, you know, get their asses off the couch and do some movement, you know, some kind of training. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just, you know, mindless repetition, it's not going to help your yeah. fighting for you, but at least, you know, you're, <laughs> you're having some exercise. You're staying in touch. That's maybe, true. That's true. maybe, you know, uh, at least soaking your inner fire for, for, for training, for, mm. for for the style, for the system, for you know, to, to keep doing it. Uh, now, the fact is, yeah, that, again, some instructors have no idea about why they have forms in their system, aside from, you know what, it's in the curriculum, so, you know, we might as, as well, you know, run. You might as well do it. I mean, <laughs> I, I saw it. It was one of, one of, you know, my major turning off points in Taekwondo, when Taekwondo, uh, became heavily into an Olympic event, you know. Uh, they have to change quite a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, uh, like probably 98% of the, the typical training in, in a Taekwondo school. Sorry, we have a passenger. Hello. Here. Hello. Uh, <coughs> so, you know, uh, you know, since forms are there for the belt testing, they will just be, you know, given uh, uh, some cursory attention a couple of weeks before testing. And honestly, 
you see people doing them, it's a very sorry view. You know, because yeah. it, mm. they th see it as a burden, something to just, you know, be, you know, getting, you know, <coughs> off, uh, uh, and, and that's uh, shame and pity because even though historically some of those forms were kind of, you know, just thrown together to have them in the first place, yeah. or, you know, to include that's some true. of the new technical elements, if done correctly, they will still work on some principles, technical yeah. principles such as posture and, and structure and uh, balance and stability yeah. and so on and so forth, I, 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 if nothing else. Yeah. And then, you That's know, fast forward to, to Master Ray's Bakbakan uh, treatment of forms. You know, they are the reposit repository of your techniques and yes. practical principles. Yeah, but from day true. one, you are taught to, you know, to, to look beyond the form as a whole. It's not a painting of the wall that you have to see as such, that you actually go and focus on details and have yeah. take it apart. Yeah. Take it apart, maybe try, uh, you know, take the puzzle apart, try playing around with the puzzle, maybe, you know, some of them will fit with uh, those other ones. And you know, it, in that way, I really see, you know, the presence of forms in uh, in uh, <laughs> training methodology as a very uh, good aspect, as a very good yeah. feature, because yeah. you you are not only taught how to perform a, a form, but actually what to do with it. What to do with? Yeah, the one thing yeah. I really like with uh, Kuya Ray's uh, training is that he starts off with like. A small set of movement and then from here mm -hmm. introduces you into another one and then eventually that leads to a longer form but while you're but while you're doing it you already have in your mind the context of why you're doing this action yeah. so it basically the 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 essence of the form is not lost and then you mm -hmm. can like you can like break them down and assemble it in different ways it it, it practically like resonates with uh, like how I teach dancing, especially tango. So yes. I like it the way I like I like the way how he how he introduced that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and he keeps repeating that the form is a tool, just yeah. means to an end, <laughs> not yeah. not an end not in end itself. itself, not not something yeah. that. that you know, sacred or something. Uh, yeah. Now that you mentioned, you know, uh, even in in boxing, you know, if you visit two thousand different gyms throughout the world, you would see the same combinations uh, of mm. being coached and thrown out. You know, yeah, jab, cross, front hook, oh. jab, cross, front. You know, is it a form? You may or may not call it that oh. way. But you will see it done, you know, all over the world. Yeah, now, it's a universal you know, uh, combination. Yeah, uh, you know, this is where, or, you know, uh, in Silat, when they teach Jurus, uh, they first teach you the, the Juru, which is a form, a, as a set of moves. But then the next step is they teach you how to break it apart. Mm. You know, some of them, mm. you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> So, so, you know, okay, so now you do the same move, but change levels between those two moves. You know, like if you have uh, jab and then cross, okay, now do high jab and, and across to the body, or, you know, vice versa, and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, if in some systems they call it pechahan, which would mean like the, the broken glass. So you have a, you know, we know that breaks, and then you, you can analyze mm -hmm. individual pieces, you know, on their own and yeah. see how they fit and how they can be used. So, yeah, you know, there's place for forms and obviously depending on, on uh, your driving motivation and what you want to do and achieve with your training, they may or may not have place in, in, in what you do. But again, basically, it, it really boils down to how you use the tools that you're given in your training. Exactly. You know, exactly. More so than, than what the tools are. Exactly. Yeah. That. Yes. You know, uh, to... Uh, 
to be honest, you know, as a practitioner, especially as if you're a fighter in, in uh, sport-oriented martial art, you know, whether it's a, uh, you know, whether it's Muay Thai or is it Taekwondo or whatever, uh, you will probably do very well if you find a compact, limited set of techniques that really suit you well. Techniques and tech, you know, and, and then work on their applications and setting points, mm -hmm. you know. You know, they, they call it every every top level uh, competitor, ha, you know, has <coughs> his or her uh, specialty, mostly. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. But if you're going to work as an instructor or coach, you do need to have a broader grasp. You know, yes, we've all exactly. yep. yep. seen and heard of that's cases true. where where great athletes ended up being lousy coaches. Mm. You know, uh, uh, and yes. not great <laughs> competitors having the, the grasp of a bigger picture and turning into mm. into yeah. phenomenal coaches. You know. Yeah, that's why we do we do have like very good athletes, but they can't like be good coaches as well. So mm -hmm. some yeah. So because it's 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 a it's almost like a different skill set. It's a different yeah uh, dimension being a coach. It is. Yes, yeah. it is. You said it. Yeah, I am. Uh, See, you know, you mentioned that, that I competed in, in several, you know, different formats and, and times. Yeah. I was never drawn to competition as a means of, you know, expressing myself uh, or, you know, uh, getting medals. I did, you know, win medals in Taekwondo, in Sanda, in whatnot. But uh, uh, the fact is I wanted to, to, you know, test the waters in that regard because, you know, thinking that I may end up having, uh, uh, you know, students, trainees who want to, to pursue that path. And I need to understand this aspect of training at least well enough to, to get them on the right path and then maybe send them off to, to elsewhere where, where they would yeah. be better catered. And that's another, I think, very important thing that uh, for me, you know, as a guy, as a guy with, with a day job and everything, uh, you know, teaching and coaching was never a commercial affair. You know, my better half probably will will have some something to say about it. Uh, so I never had problem, you know, seeing that that if I end up with uh, with a trainee or a student who would uh, get what they want or what they need better achieved elsewhere, I would send them, you know, I would refer them to, to other people. I have absolutely yeah. no issue with that, you know, saying, you know what, you would be, you would better find your this, with yeah. this or that person rather than, than staying <laughs> with me. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Uh, I think that if you have the best interest of your clients, okay, let, let's call them in that, way, you know, all yeah. the clients in mind, I think that's the only proper way to, to approach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, as a coach, you have to you have to admit that you have some limitations as well. If there Absolutely. are certain things that basically you can't, you you will be, you won't be able to deal with. Refer your client to another person who can basically best attend to what the person the, your client needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and sometimes you know uh, that's something that I, that I uh, that, that, and that's one uh, reason to do it. And there there's another. I learned it, you know, fr from my. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, Russian martial arts classes with, with uh, again w with Alex as a main coach I was typically one of the smaller guys in the in the class you know at being uh, <clears throat> under 180 you know right. uh, meters, which would be probably 511 for our you know uh, imperial uh, system friends yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, around Back then, 65, now maybe 75 to 78 kilo. you know. Uh, I would usually be one of the uh, smallest guys around. And sometimes you would have, you know, newcomers who are big, burly guys coming from backgrounds such as, you know, uh, shot put or, uh, yeah. you know, bodybuilding or kickboxing or something. So, you know, they would say, you know, uh, we want to try this whole thing, see how it goes, you know. And in Russian martial arts, you know, uh, a long time you work on uh, being relaxed, working soft, 
be before introducing who were they do introduce it in the first place, mm, you know, the, mm, the, the mm, fast mm. And, and furious kind of work. Towards the end, you know, they, they would be skeptical and, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, basically threatening the, the atmosphere, you know, they would become maybe, uh, you, you would see the seething potential conflict, you know, that they could hurt or injure other people being there for, for a wrong reason. Yeah. And, in those cases, typically towards the end of the class, for the last 15 or 20 minutes, he would say, okay, now we'll just do, you know, free ground grappling. And, you know, he would typically pair those guys against me. And, you know, uh, the fact is that with uh, a little bit of, of functional uh, grappling uh, knowledge and skill, it can be a superpower. Some people have referred it to that because it really can. You know, I, I remember... Yeah. Situation where a big shot put guy basically doubled my body weight. I was 65, he was 125. Came and then, you know, <clears throat> very stiff guy. We were doing, you know, uh, front rolls, back rolls, break rolls, and he was having trouble because, you know, there, there were no mats in the gym. We we're doing it on a hardwood floor. All so, right, okay. Again, towards the end, uh, it was a uh, grappling time. And since there were no mats, you know, the instructor said, but start on your knees, because, you know, obviously, you know, slamming somebody down, or how, but, you know, who, who would have thought it, it really eliminated my mobility. So the guys, you know, kind of grabbed me and, and you know, fell on top of me and started squeezing on, on, on my head, really. And it was a highly uncomfortable and unlikable situation. You know, he would have huge arms. I know, I know, I know. My skull, but, I, <clears throat> but I knew the skull, or at least hope the skull wouldn't break. So it was <clears throat> a very uncomfortable <clears throat> position when, with him on top yeah. of me. But I was like, you know, re yeah. re moving my I, hips, establishing, you know, position, uh, you know, and uh, he would point, trying to squeeze harder and harder, and then, you know, reestablish grip. I use it to slip around, you know, I took his back. He turned around to face me. I ended up on his chest. And he did, you know, the typical uh, inexperienced rookie thing. He tried to bench me, you know, off. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I do a textbook, you know, arm lock. Arm bar. <laughs> and all the stuff. But this guy, being a beast, he does this. And he pulls me back. He pulls me back into mount. At that point, I'm kind of, you know, thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do with this guy, you know? <laughs> and while I'm confused, he, he again, he, he takes me over, ends up in my guard, and basically walks into a triangle. And All right. And unaware of, you know, what's it going to do, I started squeezing. He didn't feel, you know, any pain at, until it started, you know, hitting in with the choking, you know, kind of uh, whizzing off. And, uh, and that's when, you know, <laughs> when he understood. But the, the fact is, <clears throat> but he never came back. Okay. And, you know, to, to get to the original point and reason for, for the story, to, to the original train of thought. Uh, so, aside from sending clients elsewhere for their own good, sometimes you have to have the tools to send them elsewhere for your own good. Yeah. You know, because having an ego-driven guy he, you know, might have come next time and then try to heal his ego by hurting somebody else who is yeah, you know, that's experienced true. That's true. and smaller and weaker and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So as an instructor, like you said, it, it's a different skill set. It's it not just, you know, uh, brawling and, and keep repeating the, the one and same thing that you're good at. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are instructors like that and, you know, unless they have a really uh, good sales pitch, you know, st story to, to tell and, and keep his uh, uh, followers, you know, because honestly, I don't, I don't think the people who, who stay for a long time with such instructors are, are students. They're, they're typically followers. It develops into some sort of culture situation, you know. Mm -hmm. you know th those instructors keep telling, no, but this is, you know, the think you don't need to know any anything else and you know just but it's secret you know don't go around showing it trying it doing it testing it you know just keep it yeah. in the family that kind of thing yeah yeah 
Yeah. The interesting I mean, enough, as, as, you know, as, as, as an instructor and coach, you're you, you need to be also considering not just your 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 clients' welfare, your other students' welfare, and your own welfare as yeah. well. Mm. If you're not obviously, if you're not running private classes, always working one on one, there are you know a lot of things in in terms of class dynamics that you have to to keep in mind. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And you know, uh, so. You know, which is why some people prefer to stay in smaller classes. Some actually thrive in, in bigger classes. You know, we had Tukon mm. Apollo, who has a great way of dealing with, with, with great classes, even, you know, yeah. Yeah. mixed in terms of age. And that's, you know, awesome. Uh, I think it, it's, you know, you can always learn something if you're looking for it, if you need, you know, if you need a skill, there are people who, who are really great at teaching, so you know you might as well learn how to teach. You know, yeah. Then you learn how to teach, and then you teach to learn more about what you do. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Very teaching, true. <clears throat> in the end, uh, it turns out that you know, uh, as the pandemic and the internet opened up more insights, uh, I tried several, you know, and I really ended up really liking uh, some of the teachers and the methods out there, you know, I tried the uh, two courses with uh, Mangtini, Makanchor, and he was phenomenal. Uh, I think that maybe, you know, all the other, you know, people tried, his material is probably the closest and most, and most compatible with the uh, Guru Rogers. Rogers, yeah. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. coming from the same, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> background. Uh, I like, you know, I, 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 I like his approach a lot. You know, he's, again, very functional, you know, sparring-based. And uh, the guys from Rapido Realismo have a great online program, which is not based, you know, there, there are some people who cannot attend Zoom classes due to time differences and stuff. Theirs is a curriculum-based with yeah, a bunch of videos cool. that you get weekly. And Guru Ghani is a phenomenal instructor. I'm, I, I'm so sorry that, you know, he is... Uh, Technical uh, support is not up to par that, that he cannot be the uh, feature in the FMA discussion because he's a great guy. Yeah, I know. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I'm working on it. I'm still working on it. So, well, you know, hopefully, yeah, at some point, you know, we will be able to, to see him because I, I really like it. You know, guy, I mean, the, the, the whole system is very well put together. And I mean, uh, uh, Guru Joseph Halifant was there as uh, the Guru. At the end, right? And yeah. I yeah. think having Guru Ghani w w would be absolutely awesome. So, you know, mm -hmm. and not to mention, so it's something along the line as, uh, you know, uh, Maestro Paolo Pagaling was a guest, another phenomenal instructor, guy with a great knack for, 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 for you know, teaching. And his uh, program of the Campo Uno Dos Tres original instruction, I think, is you know also uh, second to none. So if you're into it, yeah, yeah, it's highly recommended. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. So, but all of those people, to me, I ended up liking what they do based on how they teach, not necessarily what they teach. I mean, it, it's obviously it's a part of the equation, but their teaching approach and, and methodology are just uh, what really makes it or breaks it for me. In all these cases, yeah. he made it. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's say hi first for those who have been like watching. So you got Brett Reese, we've got Uwe, uh, Alvin Albano, Julius is in the house, hey, Robert greetings. Small, Angelo is here, uh, hey. Paul Chalis, yeah, Odi Miller. <clears throat> uh, yep, and we've got also Richard Pacman and Vaughn Bautista. So they're all saying hi to you. Hey, I'm uh, all of you have such an audience. Yeah, um, there is a comment here from Brett. If one sees everything as a triangle, which has meaning, especially here, then there exists three responses or actions to everything. So then the basics have many notes still unsung. Forgive mm -hmm. me, I'm enjoying this uh, em 
immense immensely great uh, oh, immense. great instructor to learn to learn from right good mm-hmm. uh yes. from Audi, <clears throat> yeah mm-hmm. So for yeah, Audi, that, I remember when yeah, it was... Sorry, just for a second. Now that he mentioned the triangle, you know, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned that I was a school teacher, you know, but, you know, my professional background is linguistics. So, I, you know, okay. I, I teach, yeah, I teach languages. Uh, the triangle with meaning is also basically how our mind operates. You know, th- there is what Operate, you call yes. Og- Og- Ogden Richards, uh, as a, you know, psychology student, you're probably, you know, uh, acquainted with it, that... You know, there's a triangle between uh, an actual uh, entity in the real world and our mental representation of it, and then there is our verbal representation of yeah. it. So to get the full meaning between the two collocutors, they have to share those mental representations and or verbal representations, you know, uh, to a uh, high enough degree to a... To a attain communication and mutual understanding so yeah uh and just like uh you know ju- just like in language you have you know separate uh sounds that you can put into words and then separate words that you can put in different uh, ways to, to form different sentences it is why you know i, I really like to, always going back to the to the fundamental to the to, to the basics of any you know fighting style because like they say, you know, uh, advanced techniques are the fundamentals done really, really well. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's true, you know, uh, because in the end, <clears throat> not just in terms of having always different combinations of the same techniques, but it means understanding the underlying principles. Principle behind it. Yeah, behind and underneath fundamental mm-hmm. uh, techniques. I mean, they're not fundamental for... N- for no reason. Uh, right? Yeah, for and no reason at all, you, yes. If you really understand those principles, you can start applying, experimenting with, and finding more applications for the principles, which yeah. in the end will probably even make you create mm-hmm. your own techniques, come up, come up yeah. with new ones. Uh, Grandmaster Poggy uh, mentioned that sometimes you do inspiring stuff that you never did in training. Uh, and I think it's both yes and no. <laughs> yes, in terms that you may not have done that particular movement pattern ever or in such situation, but you probably have worked on the principles that enable you to form that kind of response yes. that is elicited by certain stimulus. Yes. If your training was if your training was good. And if you had good coaching, you should have been, uh, you should have been uh, skillful enough and able enough to actually improvise. You know, come yeah, up with, yeah, with yeah. appropriate, come up with appropriate solutions to, to the challenges at uh, hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so. Uh, Right, I just got one last comment for Robert Smallhill. I know people who are great martial artists but couldn't teach, maybe. It's a process to learn to teach. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. it's true. It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, n- not, uh, not everybody has the affinity to do it, which is fine. Uh, maybe not everybody even is gifted to do it. And that too is fine as long as you feel the inner call to do it. You know, yeah. you can learn to, to overcome, you know, challenges in terms of teaching skill. <laughs> but if your motives for teaching are, mm, let's say, less than savory, mm-hmm. then I'd rather not see those kind of, uh, of persons in, in teaching anything, or, you know, let alone yeah. my Mm. I mean, of course, there are bad apples around there. And unfortunately, you know, beginners obviously have no experience and filters to separate the wheat from the chaff, which is why sometimes we hear about those, you know, unfortunate uh, events, incidents and stuff where, where, you know, uh, 
students are abused by their uh, instructors. But uh, I mean, let's be honest, it, it's not a really an endemic appearance. It, it doesn't happen just in martial arts studios. Mm. You know, no, not just that. No, no. Yeah. yeah. It happens to almost every industry, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, uh, see, I, I mentioned you know, going to France on, on a few occasions, like I took three trips. Uh, <laughs> You may or may not know that the the national judo organization with with the best organization and standards and administration is not Japanese but French, okay. and they actually yeah they, they teach judo in in their uh, grade schools and middle schools with great results and so their uh, national uh, university physical education and sport training university has a set of required educational courses and programs that all martial art instructors who want to have their own school they have to uh, undergo those programs and I which think are that, is, that is that that is that is very important which by the way i, I you know uh, i took again at, at the material and the uh, syllabuses and the course organization and what is demanded the, the criteria for passing the courses and they're phenomenal. They're they're really really well done. You know, I spend yeah. my time basically also. You know, uh, just like a trend with Luis. Uh, you know, for people who who may not know, uh, the French also have their own national yeah. and, and and star fighting style called Lacan with with a stick or cane and, and the grand baton mm -hmm. for the staff, uh, which is part of the traditionally taught as part of the. <clears throat> French boxing or the Savat uh, Federation program, which means that again, the instructors are not just, you know, a bunch of people who had previously trained for whatever, you know, amount of years and now decided to, to, to teach and coach. No, it doesn't work that way. Mm. They yeah. have to be educated as coaches. I, and, yeah. as, and especially for training with kids, some of the stuff uh, I saw in their, you know, Savat uh, classes for kids. I actually work with the physical education classes w w with kids in the school where I teach. You know, sometimes you know I'll just jump in and and do stuff. So you know, both in terms of uh, progression and pedagogy behind it, or and stuff. You know, <coughs> there is, you know, there are ways to learn. You have to be willing. You have you know, to. Whether it's by taking courses or reading books. But as long as it doesn't stay at the, ah, okay, yeah, I, I saw it. I mean, let's face it, some of the, you know, uh, some of the people will go through the courses, pass the exams, and then never apply anything from it. But then that's in the domain of personal responsibility. Exactly, exactly, exactly that, yeah. You know, the society knows that it has taken all the possible precautions to educate and, you know, build you as a, as a uh, able teacher. Yeah. Now, are you going to use or not this ability? That's a different, you know, thing. Altogether. Yeah, that's a different story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. I think <clears throat> the same thing with Israel. You can't just teach. You have to be able to, <clears throat> you have to, uh, you have to uh, undergo this uh, training as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Wingate training or something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, yeah, it's it's really important that if you're going to be teaching or coaching, you need you need to go beyond just the skills that you know. You need to understand basically how to how to teach, how to coach. There are a lot of a, a lot of things basically that goes behind. Uh, yes. Yeah, your skills. Yeah. Yes, and it's not you know it is called the art and science of teaching. Well, at least. You can do your best to get the science part, uh, you know, uh, down pat. You know, the, the art part is something that, you know, comes from within or without, but at least, you know, yeah. get the science part. That's something that, that can be, you know, learned. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So, so the same way, so it's the same with, with the training, you know, it's, there's the science and then there's the art, you know, if the science does its best, then it's up to the, again, uh, to the practitioner to, to 
I say the uh, problem with some uh, with some arts out there, you know, is that they're trying to build artists before having them be good craftsmen. Mm. Mm. You know, people will, you know, uh, I know you have an uh, Aikido background and I'm, I mean, I tried Aikido for a while, for a few months, and unfortunately I see a lot of that in, in you know, uh, in so-called soft art. You know, people go for the art while keeping the whole, uh, you know, uh, apprenticing uh, procedure. You know, if you're going to be a, a master artist, whatever, you know, painter, first you need to learn how to hold the damn, you know, first yes. learn how to draw or, you know, hold and paint by numbers and then you can exceed, you know, go out of the limits. And some people stay good craftsmen, some rise to the point of master craftsmen, artisan, yeah. and then mm. some raise to, to, to be artists yeah that's true and but skipping the the, the building blocks you know <coughs> if you if there's no foundation this <coughs> construction is probably going to crumble and hopefully that not, is, yeah. hopefully not on the people who are you know under it yeah yeah that is that is very true i mean i've been like into other arts as well and into not just martial arts but even in dance if um if you don't understand the very foundation of what you do if you don't understand the structure then you're gonna end up memorizing long uh like for example in dance you're gonna mem end up memorizing routines but mm -hmm. the only problem the problem is you you will only be able to dance these routines um with one person you won't be able to freestyle it yeah. so the same thing as with martial arts so you have you really have to understand your 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 foundation you have to build good foundations for you and try to build everything from that strong foundation so, yes yes and yeah. it's easier to build a foundation if you have proper you know method to do it <clears throat> yes you know, exactly. methodology is not there then you you know you, you're kind of hoping for the best exactly oh wow this has been a very very nice interview with you guru gagi yeah and um, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that most of our viewers have managed wow, to we, pick we're up. Wow, two hours uh, in truth. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. I mean, the conversation just kept on flowing. So, um, yeah. And I, the, I really... I time, I, I'm a motor mouth. As <laughs> I've been able to, to, to feel on the other side, yeah. uh, on the receiving side. Well, so, you know, sorry for that. Yeah. No worries. So, I mean, uh, we, I mean, we, as we close this now, uh, what message can you give to the FMA community? I think I already mentioned it. First of all, I would like us to really be a community because in a community, you know, obviously with, with all the, you know, personal differences and stuff, uh, we should be aware of what the needs of the community are. Hmm. So, you know, he, you know, in historically in, in uh, communities where people depend on each other, when somebody isn't able to contribute in a certain context, at least they will try not to hinder yeah. the, the, you know, existence and, and development and evolution of the community. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that uh, I think if we educate ourselves as a community in, in, in terms of uh passing this whole thing uh well wrong enough i think that that's the only way to make sure we will preserve the the arts as we would like to see them yes some of them yeah. will remain and should remain traditional as uh as an <clears throat> insight into the past because like i said there is a value to it we learn why some things are done the way they're done and but also you know going into the future by working on developing our our, our stuff uh, to maintain our functional ability to yeah. do what we do you know uh, to not lose touch with this legacy of, of what we do yeah wow nice words excellent words excellent words so 
I do, guys. I do hope, guys, that you enjoyed this uh, interview with uh, Guru Gagi and the insights that he gave when it comes to um, more than just being practitioner, but about also being a teacher, being a coach, about curriculum, about uh, uh, forms and drills. Okay. Um, so thank, thank, you, thank you very you much. For the opportunity to to share my thoughts on those subjects. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure Guru Roger will be really. Uh, uh, I would say blessed that you 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 were interviewed as well as 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 one as one one of his instructors in uh, I hope, I hope so too, yeah. yeah, I know he'll be. Oh, Hyle is here. <laughs> Come on, Hyle. Rather hot. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So once again, thank you very much, Gurgagi, and see you this weekend. Have a nice day, okay. night, whatever. Yeah. Depending on, on the place you, in the world you are and see you around yeah yeah thank you very much for for all your insights okay so there you go guys that's uh, episode 234 with uh guru gagi um and um in about 10 15 minutes we're gonna have the test run for uh grandmaster tobias Riker for his uh, live interview tomorrow. Okay, this is uh, Guru Tom Pena signing off and thank you very much again for watching this live interview. Um, all the interviews will be posted in our FMA YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe.